All right, everyone, so we're going to start taking a look at key issue one for chapter seven. And before we get started in the main key issue, the first two things we're going to take a look at is the difference of a couple terms that they give us, and it's race and ethnicity. When we talk about race, we are talking more about a biological ancestry. Now, even though one would argue that when we talk about race, we're talking about everybody is of one race, we are the human race, we do classify people based on somewhat skin color what a race is. So when we say race, a lot of times we're talking about the biological ancestry. When we start talking about ethnicity, that's the cultural tradition. So a race can have many different ethnicities within it. And we go in more in depth throughout the key issue. Well, key issue one is going to ask, where are ethnicities distributed? And when we look about the distribution of ethnicities, we're going to look at where they lie within space. We're going to look at different regions in the United States and where those ethnicities dominate that area because that explains a lot about human geography. So for example, the Southwest United States, and in some cases the Gulf Coast of the Southeast, that area is dominated by Hispanics. When we look at the different ethnicities, we need to know why. Why is that region? And when we explore that region, we see that that's the closest to the Latin American area. So that's the reason why we would see that. When we look at African Americans, we know that African Americans dominate the Southeast United States. When we look at that, we know that that's where, for the past two, three hundred years, many African Americans were staged to live. And it goes back to the days of slavery. Now we'll see different groups in other areas. We'll see Hispanics and Blacks live in northern cities, but we're looking at where the highest concentration of these people are. Another example is Asia. A lot of Asians live along the Pacific coast because, again, that's the closest area to Asia itself. But interestingly enough, we'll see a lot of Asian communities along the east coast, especially in the New England and the mid-Atlantic areas. And that has to do with those being larger cities, and larger cities attract immigrants. And we also see that there will be some other reasons as we go along in our chapter. Finally, American Indians. When we look at where American Indians are dominating, we'll see for the most part it tends to be the West. And we tend to see them uh, dominating on, plain, uh, on their reservations. And that is because when we started doing Indian Removal Acts, we started moving Indians to certain areas in America. So while we'll have reservation areas, for example, the Seminole areas in Florida and Iroquois areas up in the New England area, we'll see that a higher percentage of Native Americans live out West. All right, we're back and we're going to start taking a look at ethnicities and cities. To give an idea of what they're trying to talk about is to see that we look at the United States and in the United States, most of our cities are where we're going to find what we call minorities. It's the rural areas where we tend to find what we classify in America as white people. So we need to figure out why, why it is it that way. Now to give an example specifically of what they're talking about, they start with Detroit. 85% of Detroit is black. But Michigan as a whole, the entire state, the population is only 7% black. So when we look at most of the black population of Michigan, it's going to be in Detroit. They also use Chicago as an example. 35% of Chicago is black. So that's 50% of the state's population of black people live in Chicago. So again, we're starting to see that in the rural areas, they tend to be a little bit more white dominated. New York is given as another example. New York is 25% Hispanic, but if you take the entire state, the entire state only has 17% of the people claiming to be Hispanic. So we again see that a much of the Hispanic people live inside the city. Now when we look at why, there's several reasons as we look out through American history. And one of the reasons is that people tend to move to neighborhoods. People who are a certain race or culture are going to move to neighborhoods where they are also of that race or culture. And there's been different reasons throughout history, but the main reason is jobs. Cities offer jobs. And as people move to a city, they tend to migrate and move to where there's people of the same ethnicity. And also is where there tends to be cheaper land. And as people move into the city, they move to where the cheaper land is. And later on in this section, we start learning about that and what we call the ghetto and people moving into those areas. 
All right, so next we're going to take a look at African Americans and their migration pattern. And this is a great way to use as an example, especially in an FRQ type of situation. So we've just recently talked about how African Americans dominated the Southeast United States region. So why did they spread out? Where did they spread out to? That's what we're going to take a look at. Well, first we need to go back in time. Why did African Americans dominate the Southeast region? Well, it goes back to the age of triangular trade. And it's when the slave market was working. About 10 million slaves were brought from Africa to the Americas. Now, the thing is, only about 5% actually make it to the United States region. The rest stayed in the Caribbean area and Brazil. So those that were brought into North America and the United States stayed primarily in the South because they were being used for slavery. Even in, during the colonial era, slavery was frowned upon in the North and usually banned. So most of these Africans were brought into uh, the United States to work in the South. Well, triangular trade was the process of doing this, and that's where it formed a triangle. You went from the United States area to Europe. They would take supplies there. They would take supplies from Europe to Africa, dump it off. Then they would take slaves to the Americas, and it formed a triangular shape. So that's where we get most of this slavery going on. In 1808, the United States banned slavery. And then by 19, 1865, it's banned with the 13th Amendment. Well, that did not fix the problem at that time period. Because even though slavery ended, most slaves remained on their plantations and they remained working in the South. They didn't have the money or the method to move from there. They were poor slaves. They were not allowed to have any true possessions. So most slaves stayed in the Southern region and because they didn't have the money, and they stayed as sharecroppers, which means basically they worked on the property and gave a share of their crop to the owner of the plantation in return for being allowed to remain there. All right, so now we're going to take a look at how did the African Americans from the South start migrating the North? Why? Well, there's two main eras where this basically happens. The first is from 1910 to 1920. This is called the Great Migration. During World War I, many, many soldiers had to go off to fight in battle. Well, the businesses were desperate to find workers. They were relying on immigrants, but it's war. So we were not allowing immigrants into America. So even in the North, many of these businesses were racist, and they didn't want to use the black workers from the South, but they had no choice. So many, many blacks were able to start moving up north. Some of them were even paid to move up there by businesses because they were desperate for America to have uh, workers in the war machine to build the weapons that were needed in World War I. So we start to see more and more African Americans moving to the north. Then again in 1940 and 1950, we start seeing it again. Because of World War II, the northern businesses were desperate for workers to build these war industry stuff. So they started bringing southern blacks up north to be able to work in the factories. This also led to chain migration. Once a lot of African American families were living in the northern cities, it enabled more and more blacks to be able to move from the south to the north. So the two main eras that we're looking at was the Great Migration Era from 1910s to the 1920 era and from the 1940s into the 1950s where we see again a big influx of southern blacks moving north. So now we're going to start looking at a little bit of the history of race problems in the United States. We start seeing, number one, in the South, slavery has ended. So what was supposed to happen was there'd be equality between blacks and whites in the South. The South is going to work very hard to prevent this from happening. In the North, where black people were supposed to be free and there was no slavery, there was still a lot of racism. The difference is in the South, they got away with it through using the separate but equal uh, policy as it gets to be known. And this led to Jim Crow laws. Jim Crow laws were created after the Civil War, and these were laws that tried to prevent black people from becoming equal. They allowed, they forced literacy tests to be able to vote. Well, if you were a slave, you were never taught to read. You weren't allowed to be. So a lot of people could not read. That, that, that disallowed them from being able to vote or have any kind of rights. Uh, they could require you to pay to vote. Again, if you were a slave and a sharecropper, you're probably not going to have a lot of money or be able to. So these Jim Crow laws were created to try to oppress the black people that were given the freedom by the Union Army that moved to the South. 
This then led to a big lawsuit because in 1896, there was a lawsuit called Plessy versus Ferguson. And Plessy versus Ferguson basically said Jim Crow laws were illegal. They've got to be gotten rid of. Well, the Supreme Court, and many argued they were kind of gutless when they did this, the Supreme Court came along and said, well, it says indirectly in our Constitution that we're separate but equal. Basically, in the Constitution, it says we're separate people, but because we're separate people, we're equal. Well, what the Supreme Court does with that is make the separate but equal doctrine. And they say separate but equal means you can have colored bathrooms and white bathrooms because they're separate, but you have to have bathrooms for both groups. You can have a colored water fountain and a white water fountain. That's fine because they're separate but equal. And that was obviously deemed illegal much later, but it still went on. And it created more and more problems later on. Well, eventually we start to see a lot of African Americans moving from the south into the inner cities up north. That's going to create what's called white flight. White flight is when a lot of white people will move out of an area and it creates problems with property value. Property value crashes. Now, the good part about that is it enables people to move out of one region to another region to be able to afford it. But what that also leads to is what we later on is categorized as ghettos. The term ghettos came from Germany during World War II. Ghettos are where the Jewish people were forced into living all in one area. That idea, that term was then copied and placed into America, and we eventually start using the term in the inner city where poor people live. Well, Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954 said you can't segregate schools, that you cannot have all white schools and all black schools, and it forced segregation in. This also contributed to white flight because what began to happen where white people who did not agree with that picked up and moved away. And they moved to areas where they were tending to be white schools only just by the demographics of people living there. So that's where we start to see more and more people moving out of one area and more and more people like black people, let's say, or Hispanic people moving into a neighborhood in northern cities. We also will learn about a term in this section called blockbusting. Blockbusting is a very dirty tactic that is illegal today. But what would happen is unscrupulous realtors will go into a white neighborhood that's near a black neighborhood and go up to the residents and tell them, hey, look who's living down the street. Look who lives two streets over. Do you really want to be living with those people? So we're going to give you X amount of dollars for your house, but you know what? You better hurry because if you don't take the money now, you know, your property value is going to crash. And I know, it's, I know we're giving you less than what your house is worth, but if you don't take the money now, Oh man, what's going to happen to your property value? And they would go from house to house threatening people with, if you don't sell now, look who's going to move in. And as soon as black people started moving into the neighborhood, and a lot of times these realtors would intentionally black, move black families in, the white families would again sell for less and less money moving out. The realtors would then turn around and sell the properties for good prices, but more than what they paid for. And that enabled more and more black families to move in, which caused more and more white families to move out. So we see white flight going on there, and then that tactic of white flight is blockbusting. Blockbusting today is illegal. It still will go on occasionally, but it is deemed illegal today. All right, so the last section we're gonna take a look at is apartheid. And apartheid was basically South Africa's version of our Jim Crow laws and our segregation. What they had to do in South Africa was control the majority. In many ways, what they were doing in the South in the United States, where the whites were in the minority compared to the amount of African slaves that were here. So what they did in South Africa was make these apartheid laws. And their goal was to segregate, to strip the black Africans of all their power so that the whites could continue to have control there. This went on for the longest time, and the people that were running it was called the Afrikaners. And these were basically Dutch or English descendants who lived in the area to control it. Well, apartheid took a lot and a lot of pressure into the 70s and 80s, when more and more of the world said, this is wrong and we can't have this. Rock bands like U2 protested against it, sent money there from concerts to help fight it. Countries began to boycott, including ExxonMobil, and other companies refused to do business in South Africa. And finally, in 1991, 
the government caved in because of a lot of economic sanctions being put on to them. By 1994, a miracle happened, and a guy named Mil Nelson Mandela wins the election, and he becomes the first black African to be able to run the country. Nelson Mandela had been in prison for many, many years speaking out against apartheid. So he gets released from prison and in 94 wins. So it really had to do with a lot of finances. It was the financial pressure put on South Africa. And when the South, black South Africans began to be able to vote, that's what led to finally Nelson Mandela winning office and beginning to um, really end the apartheid there. The scars are still there. We still see ethnic neighborhoods. Countries like Lesotho formed because of um, that's one group that was able to break off of South Africa's control. And we Swaziland is another example of it. So we start seeing where there's a lot of division there. And the uh, basically um, Armageddon idea that the Afrikaners had that would happen did not happen. South Africa still has a ways to go, but there is the end of oppression there. And we're starting to see more and more equality as the years go on.